and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. This one still deals with uh, section 2 of um, the book A Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris about the Jesuits in the 16th and 17th century and we are left with the last part, that chapter 6 as I told you last time in the last recording that that's going to be a little bit longer of course because Edmond Paris was a Frenchman and so, of course, he, dug, he dug a little bit deeper into the history of the Jesuits in France than anywhere else. But also, and uh, that's the way that he starts here, in 1551 the order started to establish itself in France, which was 17 years after its foundation in the chapel Saint-Denis at Montmartre. You have to understand, of course, that the order was actually founded in France. So, of course, this chapter of uh, six of France is a little bit longer than the others. I have no problem with that. It's going to be quite interesting, you know. Indeed, they presented themselves as effective adversaries of the Reformation, which had won about one-seventh of the French population. But people mistrusted these soldiers too devoted to the Holy See. So, their penetration of French soil was slow at first. As in all other countries where general opinion was not in their favor, they insinuated themselves first amongst the people at court, then threw them into the upper classes. But in Paris, the parliament, the university and even the clergy remained hostile. It came out clearly when they first attempted to open a college there. I'm just going to make a little comment here on that they first as in all other countries, you know, um, they went uh, at the court and through them they went to the upper classes. Um, it says that uh, in German we have that saying, uh, der Fisch fängt am Kopf an zu stinken. That means <laughs> the fish starts stinking at the head, you know. Yeah, they infiltrate the head first and from that they get down because then you have really influence and that's the thing that they always do. So they start at the court and uh, the upper classes, the uh, 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 aristocracy, went into those people and uh, yeah, that's their policy they always, uh, they always uh, followed. Now the faculty of theology, whose mission is to safeguard the principles of religion in France, decreed on the 1st of December 1554 that Quote, this society appears to be extremely dangerous regarding the faith. She is an enemy of the church's peace, fatal to the monastic state, and seems to have been born to bring ruin rather than edification. Unquote. From Gaston Belly. Here is something cited that we should all remember the day of today, if you ask me. This society appears appears to be extremely dangerous regarding the faith. It is because they are the army of the Roman Catholic Church, of the synagogue of Satan. And that is the wrong face. So for the true face, they are extremely dangerous. Fatal to monastic states and they seem to have been born to bring ruin rather than edification. That is, and when you remember the things that were spoken of in the oath of the Jesuits, then you absolutely understand that. I'm going to give you a little quote here from the oath. It reads here, You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace. What more proof do you need of the destructive working of the Jesuit order? I think this more or less says it all, right? But let's continue here. So the author continues. The fathers were nevertheless allowed to settle at Belon, in a corner of Auvergne. From there they organized a great action against the Reformation in the provinces of southern France. You know, southern France is also this 
uh, the the landmark of Piedmont, that was the region where the Valdensis were active. The famous Lainis, the man at the Council of Trent, distinguished himself in polemics, especially at the colloquy of Poissy, of Poissy in an unhappy attempt to conciliate the two doctrines in 1561 during the Council of Trent. Thanks to the Queen Mother Catherine of Medici, what a devilish woman she was, the order opened its first Parisian establishment, the College of Clermont, which was in competition with the university. The opposition from this university, the clergy and the parliament was more or less uh, pacified with the concessions, verbal at least, made by the company who promised to conform to the common right. But the university had fought hard and long against the introduction of men bribed at the expense of France to arm themselves against the king, according to Etienne Pasquier, and whose words were proved right not long after. There is no need to ask if the Jesuits consented to the St. Bartholomew Massacre in 1572. Did they prepare it? Who knows? The company's politics subtly and supple, and, uh, and supple in their proceedings have very clear aims. It is the Pope's politics destroy heresy. Everything must be subordinated to this major aim. Catherine of Medici worked towards this aim, and the company could count on the Guises. Unquote. Did they prepare St. Bartholomew's Massacre? You bet. But this major design helped so much that massacre on the night of the 24th of August 1572 provoked a terrible blaze of traditional hate. Three years later, it was the League, after the assassination of the Duke de Guise, nicknamed the King of Paris and the appeal to his most Christian majesty to fight the Protestants. Quote, the shrewd Henry III did his best to avoid a war of religion. In agreement with Henry of Navarre, they gathered the Protestants and most of the moderate Catholics against Paris, the League, and these partisans, mad Romans back in Spain. Um, the League, if you don't understand that, that is a League that was founded by Catholics to actually... So this League is actually a kind of uh, a company um, that uh, many Catholics uh, combined themselves together in a so-called Holy League against the Huguenots. And you know that St. Bartholomew Massacre was, of course, against the Huguenots. So, this is the League that uh, I'm speaking here in the book about, if you don't understand that. So, I'm just going to repeat the last paragraph. The shrewd Henry III did his best to avoid a war of religion. In agreement with Henry of Navarre, they gathered the Protestants and most of the moderate Catholics against Paris, the League, and these partisans, mad Romans, backed by Spain. Yeah? So, the League are not moderate Catholics. <laughs> That's why they are mentioned here again. The Jesuits, powerful in Paris, protested that the King of France had surrendered to heresy. The directing committee of the League deliberated at the Jesuits' house in the street Saint-Antoine. Was Spain holding Paris? Hardly. Was the League holding Paris? Well, the League was only an instrument in skillful Jesuit hands, let me say. This company of Jesus who had been fighting in the name of Rome for thirty years now, this was Paris's secret master. So Henry III was assassinated. As the heir was a Protestant, the murder seemed at first glance to have been for other than political reasons. But is it not possible that those who planned it and persuaded the Jacobin Clément to carry it out were hoping for an uprising of Catholic France against the Huguenot heir? 
The fact is that a little later Clément was called an angel by the Jesuit Camelet, and Guignard, another Jesuit who was eventually hanged, gave his students as a means of moulding their opinions tyrannical act texts as subjects for their Latin exercises. Amongst other things, these school exercises contained this, quote, Jacques Clément has done a mer meritorious act inspired by the Holy Spirit. If we can make war against the king, then let us do it. If we cannot make war against him, then let us put him to death. Unquote. And this, we made a big mistake at the St. Bartholomew. We should have bled the royal vein. Unquote. Now, Jacques Clément has done a meritorious act inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is what Guignard, that Jesuit, let, their, uh, let his students write in that time. It was a meritorious act to assassinate a king. Doesn't that remind you of something again that comes out of the Jesuit oath? It says there that the word I-N-R-I means Iustrum Neca Reges Impius, the meaning of which is it is just to exterminate or annihilate impious, impious, sorry, impious or heretical kings, governments or rulers. You see this all over the place, all over the actions of the Jesuits. And then there are some people who say the Jesuit oath is a hoax. Well, I do not agree because when you see their works, everything points to the actions written down in these oaths. We made a big mistake at St. Bartholomew. We should have bled the royal vein. When you write something like this against your own king, isn't that treason? And that are reasons for why Jesuits were sometimes, <laughs> much too seldom, persecuted and hanged because of treason. In 1592, a certain Barriere, who tried to assassinate Henry IV, confessed that Father Varade, rector of the Jesuits in Paris, had persuaded him to do it. In 1594, another attempt was made by Jean Châtel, former pupil of the Jesuits who had heard his confession just before carrying it out. Now listen. It was on that occasion that the previously mentioned school exercises were seized at the house of Father Guignard. Quote, the father has hanged at Greve, while the king confirmed an edict of parliament banishing the sons of Loyola from the kingdom as corruptors of youth, disturbers of public peace, and enemies of the state and crown of France. Now, the edict was not carried out fully, and in 1603 it was revoked by the king against the advice of parliament. Aquaviva, the general of the Jesuits at that time, had been clever in his maneuvers and led King Henry IV to believe that the order, re-established in France, would loyally serve national interests. Uh-oh! Aquaviva had been clever in his maneuvers and led King Henry IV to believe that the order of the Jesuits, which was re-established in France, would loyally serve national interests? How dumb can you be as a king not to understand that the Jesuits always only work, like all Catholics by the way, for the gain of the Roman Catholic Church? They pay their first allegiance to Rome, not to the country they live in, not to the country they are supposed to serve. But Aquaviva, the general of the Jesuits, led King Henry IV to believe that the order would loyally serve national interests. How could he, subtle as he was, believe that these fanatical Romans would indeed accept the Edict of Nantes from 1498, which determined the rights of Protestants in France, and even worse, they would back up his projects against Spain and the Emperor. 
You know, the Edict of Nantes is maybe something that you have not heard about, but that was a contract between the ruling powers and the Protestants, the Huguenots, that they could live out their religion freely. This protected the Protestants in France at that time. But we will come later on to King Louis XIV who revoked the Edict of Nantes and we will talk about that just in a few minutes. Now the fact is Henry IV chose as his confessor and tutor for the Dauphin one of, his, uh, one of the most distinguished members of the company, Father Cotton. On the 16th of May 1610, on the eve of his campaign against Austria, he was murdered by Ravaillac, who confessed, listen closely, having been inspired by the writings of Father Mariana and Suarez. These two sanctioned the murders of heretic tyrants or those insufficiently devoted to the papacy's interests. The Duke of Ipernon, who made the king read a letter while the assassin was lying in wait, was a notorious friend of the Jesuits, and Michelet proved that they knew of this attempt. Quote, this is it. In fact, Ravaillac had confessed to the Jesuit father Daubigny just before, and when the judges interrogated the priest, he merely replied that God had given him the gift to forget immediately what he had heard in the confessional. <laughs> I was already leading up to this reading a few minutes. This is just too great. How do you call that? Mental reservation. Huh? Have you heard that before? In fact, this quote, I'm going to give it to you again. It's, in fact, Ravaillac had confessed to the Jesuit father Daubigny just before, and when the judges interrogated the priest, he merely replied that God had given him the gift to forget immediately what he heard in the confessional. That's how you get your head out of trouble speaking things like this. Parliament persuaded that Ravaillac had only been a tool for the company, ordered the executioner to burn Mariana's book. Fortunately, Aquaviva was still there. Once again, this great general schemed well. He condemned most severely the, leg the legitimacy of tyrannicide. The company always had authors who, in the silence of their studies, exposed the doctrine in all its rectitude. She also possessed great politicians who, when necessary, would put the right masks on it. Thanks to Father Coton, who took the situation in hand, the Society of Jesus came out of the storm unscathed. Her wealth the number of her establishment and adherents grew rapidly. But when Louis XIII came to the throne and Richelieu took the affairs of the state in hand, there was a clash of wills. Richelieu is the one you know from all the movies of the Three Musketeers, by the way. The Cardinal Richelieu would not let anyone oppose his politics, Roman Catholic politics, Council of Trent politics, anti-Protestant politics. The Jesuit Croissant, confessor of the king, was able to find that out when he was put in prison at Rennes on Richelieu's order as a state criminal. This act produced the best results. In order to stay in France, the order went as far as collaborating with the redoubtable minister. H. Bomer wrote this about it. Quote, the lack of consideration for the Church always shown by the French government since Philip le Bel in the conflicts between national and ecclesiastic interests had been, once again, the best politics. Unquote. The accession of Louis XIV marked the start of the most prosperous time for the order. So you already know where this is going to, right? 
the accession of Louis XIV marked the start of the most prosperous time for the Order of the Jesuits. So when the Order of the Jesuits prospers, then everybody else loses. The laxism of Jesuit confessors, this clever leniency they used to attract sinners not very anxious to make penance, was employed extensively amongst ordinary people as well as at court especially with the king who was more a ladies man than devout devout catholic that is his majesty speaking about the sun king louis the fourteenth louis xiv his majesty had no intention of renouncing his amorous affairs and his confessor was careful to keep off the subject in spite of it being plain adultery so all the royal family was soon provided with Jesuit confessors, only, and their influence grew more and more against the high society, amongst the high society. The priests of Paris attacked in their writings the loose morals and the famous company's casuists, but to no avail. Pascal himself intervened in vain in favor of the Jansenites, during the great theological quarrel of that time, in his provincial letters, he exposed their two worldly opponents, the Jesuits, to eternal ridicule. In spite of it, the secure place they held at court assured them of victory, and those of Port Royal succumbed. The order was to win another great victory for Rome, whose consequences were a against national interests. Hello! What was I saying a little bit before when we were speaking about um, this uh, other king yeah, who was lulled by uh, Aqua Viva into that uh, the Society of Jesus would act for the best interest of the country? No. What do we read right here now? The order was to win another great victory for Rome, whose consequences were against national interests. It goes without saying, of course, that they had n uh, that they had only unwillingly accepted the religious peace assured through the Edict of Nantes, and had continued a secret war against the French Protestants. As Louis the Fourteenth was getting older. He turned more and more to bigotry under the influence of Madame de Maintenon and Father Lachaise, his confessor. Yeah, Father Lachaise was the one, and I wrote that in uh, in another reading. I think therefore you have to go to to the book uh, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hesler because I only read that in German. Um, there he explains about the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth, who was Jesuit Father de Lachaise and how he convinced him of revoking the Edict of Nantes, meaning uh, revoking the security given to the Protestants in France, how he did that, how subtly he did that, with, with politics he did that. You can read that in Alexander, the, uh, in Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. I'm not going to read that here, but I read that in German. So if you want to know more about Father Lachaise, uh, look that up in the book. You know, you can... Um, well, I'm just going to read to you that little part of um, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons on page uh, 127. I got that here. In the famous letter of Père Lachaise, the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth of France, giving an account of the method which he had adopted to gain the consent of that licentious monarch to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, by which such cruelties were inflicted on his innocent Huguenot subjects, we see how the fear of the scales of St. Michael operated in bringing about the desired result. Many a time since, says the accomplished Jesuit, de la Chaise, referring to an atrocious sin of which the king had been guilty. Many a time since, when I have had him at confession, I have shook hell about his ears, and made him sigh, fear and tremble, before I would give him absolution. 
By this I saw that he had still an inclination to me, and was willing to be under my government. So I set the baseness of the action before him by telling the whole story, and how wicked it was, and that it could not be forgiven till he had done some good action to balance that and extirpate the crime. Whereupon he at least asked me what he must do. I told him that he must root out all heretics from his kingdom. This was the good action to be cast into the scale of St. Michael the Archangel to balance his crime. The king, wicked as he was, so sore against his will consented. The good action was cast in, the heretics were extirpated, and the king was absolved. But yet the absolution was not such but that, when he went the way of all the earth, there was still such to be cast before the scales could be fairly adjusted. Thus paganism and popery alike make merchandise of the souls of men. But the point that I want to make, and this is probably at another part in this book uh, where it stands in, is that de la Chaise, the confessor of Henry the Fourteenth, told the king to do this action against the Protestants because he said they were lost anyway, so he would do God a service when he persecuted and killed the Protestants. He would actually do God a service and that's why the king consented. That is how Father Lachaise, the confessor of Louis the Fourteenth, worked the politics to get the Edict of Nantes revoked. As Louis the Fourteenth was getting older, I repeat this sentence here another time now. He turned more and more to bigotry under the influence of Madame de Maintenon and Father Lachaise, his confessor. In 1861 they persuaded him to restart the persecution against the Protestants, and I just explained to you how. Finally, on the 17th of October 1685, he signed the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, making those of the subjects who refused to embrace the Catholic religion, outlaws. Soon after, to accelerate the conversions, those famous Dragonites started. That sinister name became part of all subsequent attempts to proselytize by fire and chains. While the fanatics cheered, the Protestants fled from the kingdom en masse. According to Marshal Vauban, France lost in that way 400,000 inhabitants and 60 million francs. Manufacturers, merchants, ship owners, skillful artisans went to other countries and brought them the benefit of their abilities. 17th of October 1685 was a day of victory for the Jesuits, the final reward for a war which had gone on for 125 years without respite, but the state paid the cost of the Jesuits' victory. The depopulation, the reduction of national prosperity, were the acute material consequences of their triumph, followed by a spiritual impoverishment which could not be cured, even by the best Jesuit school. This what France suffered and the Society of Jesus had to pay for very dearly later. Does that remind you of what the United States of America has become? Uh, the more power the Society of Jesus gains in the United States of America, the more that country goes into oblivion, into debt, doesn't produce anymore. The state has to pay the cost for the Jesuits' victory, and that's in America today, 2016, exactly the same as it was here in the 17th century in France. It has always been that way where the Jesuits were educating so-called the people, where the Jesuits were ruling. But during the century following, the sons of Loyola saw not only France, but all the European countries reject them from their midst. But once again, it was only for a while. And you know, 
when the Jesuits were thrown out of different European countries, I told you during my reading of Rulers of Evil, that you can turn to when you want to understand that, I can't repeat all that here again now, that that was only the plan of the that at that time reigning general of the society, Lorenzo Ricci, to secularize the order. And that's what they did. Very successful. These fanatical janissaries of the papacy had not finished to accumulate ruins in the pursuit of their impossible dream. This finishes section 2. And we gonna continue now reading on the foreign missions in section 3. Chapter 1 deals with the foreign missions of the Jesuit order in India, Japan and China. And it's quite interesting, I can promise you that. So, hang on for another half an hour or something that I'm gonna read this. The conversion of pagans had been the first objective of the Society of Jesus Founder. Even though the necessity to combat Protestantism in Europe <coughs> involved its disciples more and more, and, in this uh, and this in political as well as religious action, of which we just gave a short summary, became their main task, they still pursued the evangelization of distant lands. The theocratic ideal, to bring the world under the Holy See's authority, required that they should go into all the regions of the globe in the conquest of souls. Their theocratic ideal, what is the theocratic ideal of the Jesuit order? The church to rule the world, the pope to rule the church, and the Jesuits to rule the Pope. That is their theocratic ideal. Francis Xavier, one of Ignatius' first companions who, like him, was canonized by the Church, was the great promoter of Asia's evangelization. In 1542, that's when they really started their work, two years after their uh, augeration, by Pope Paul III, when they, by negotiations, took over the Inquisition from the Dominicans. In 1542, Francis Xavier disembarked at Goa and found there a bishop, a cathedral and a convent of Franciscans who, together with some Portuguese priests, had already tried to spread around them, uh, to spread around them the religion of Christ. Yeah. Francis Xavier, you have to understand, dear listener, that Pope Francis did not take his name from Francis of Assisi, as he openly claims, but he surely took his name from Francis Xavier, the one who was the great promoter of Asia's evangelization. Didn't the Pope go to Thailand last year or the year before? I made this little video, the fleeing Pope, you can look that up. Isn't he evangelize all the world? Isn't he going out in the world to so-called evangelize, Christianize the people, or what he calls Christianity, which is not Christianity, but that's what he does. That's what Francis Xavier did, and that's why Pope Francis 2016 took the name from Francis Xavier of the 16th century. He gave that first attempt such a strong impetus that he was surnamed the Apostle of India. Actually, he was more pioneer and exciter than one who really accomplished something lasting. Fiery, enthusiastic, always on the lookout for new fields of action, he showed the way more than he cleared the ground. In the kingdom of Travancore at Malacca, on the islands of Banda, Makassar and Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka today, his personal charm and his eloquent speeches did wonders and, as a result, 70,000 quote-unquote idolaters were converted especially amongst the low caste. 
70,000 idolaters were converted into another idolatrous and superstitious religion, the Roman Catholic religion. 70,000 were converted amongst the low caste. The low caste, so. To obtain this, he did not despise the political and even military support of the Portuguese. These results, more showy than solid, were bound to rouse interest for the missions in Europe, as well as throwing a brilliant luster over the Society of Jesus. The untiring but little preserving apostle soon left India for Japan, then China, where he was about to enter when he died at Canton in 1552. His successor in India, no, no, Robert de Nobile, applied in that country the same methods the Jesuits used in Europe very successfully. He appealed to the higher classes. You know, the fish starts to stink on the top. Huh? To the untouchables, he gave the consecrated water only on the end of a stick. He adopted the clothes, habits and way of living of the Brahmins, mixed their rites with Christian ones, all with the approval of Pope Gregory the Fifteenth. Thanks to this ambiguity, he converted, so he claimed, 250,000 Hindus. But, quote, about a century after his death, when the intransigent Pope Benedict the Fourteenth forbade the observance of these Hindu rites, everything collapsed and the 250,000 pseudo-Catholics disappeared, unquote. In the North Indian territories of the great Mughal Akbar, a tolerant man who even tried to introduce into his state a religious syncretism, the Jesuits were allowed to build an establishment at Lahore in 1575. Akbar's successors granted them the same favors. But Aurangzeb, who lived between 1666 and 1707, an Orthodox Muslim, put an end to this enterprise. In 1549, Francis Xavier embarked for Japan with two companions and a Japanese he had converted at Malacca called Yagiro. The beginnings were not very promising. Quote, the Japanese have their own mortality and are rather reserved. Their past has set them in paganism. The adults look at those strangers with amusement and the children follow them, jeering." Unquote. Now Yagiro, a native, managed to start a small community of 100 adherents. But Francis Xavier, who did not speak Japanese very well, could not even obtain an audience from the Mikado, that's the emperor. When he left that country, two fathers stayed behind, who eventually secured the conversion of the daimos of Arima and Bungo. When this particular one so decided in 1578, he had to be considering the matter for 27 years. The following year, the father settled at Nagasaki. And now it gets interesting when you can think for yourself. The following year, 1579, the Jesuits settled in Nagasaki. Listen what happens over the time here. They pretended to have converted 100,000 Japanese. In 1587, the internal situation of the land, torn apart by clan wars, changed entirely. Quote, the Jesuits had taken advantage of that anarchy and their close relations with Portuguese merchants. Unquote. Hideyoshi, a man of low birth, had usurped power and taken the title of Taiko Sama. He distrusted the Jesuits' political influence, their association with the Portuguese and their connections with the great and wild vessels, the samurai. In consequence, the young Japanese church was violently persecuted, six Franciscans and three Jesuits were crucified, many converts were murdered and the order was banished. Nevertheless, the decree was not carried out. 
the Jesuits continued their apostolate in secret. But in 1614, the first shogun, Tokugawa Yagazu, became uneasy with their occult actions and the persecution started again. Besides, the Dutch had taken the place of the Portuguese at the business counters and were closely watched by the government. A profound distrust of all foreigners, ecclesiastics or laymen inspired from then on the account of, lead, uh, of leaders and, in 1638, a rebellion of the Nagasaki Christians was drowned in blood. For the Jesuits, the Japanese adventure had come to an end and was to remain so for a long time. Now, in 1638, a rebellion of the Nagasaki quote-unquote Christians, uh, Catholics, was drowned in blood. For the Jesuits, the Japanese adventure had come to an end. Now you understand why Nagasaki was chosen as the as the goal for the second atomic bomb the Americans so allegedly threw on Nagasaki. That these bombs were probably bombs from the ground and were not uh, bombs thrown by a plane. That is another theory and another thing to go in and to research. But the point is the Jesuits never forgive and the Jesuits never forget and they will take vengeance. And in 1638 in that rebellion the uh, so-called Christians had a drowned in blood revolution unsuccessfully and before as I read to you different Jesuits were even crucified there in Nagasaki, I tell you that Nagasaki in 1945 was vengeance, was payback for 1638. Now we can read in the remarkable work of Lord Bertrand Russell, Science and Religion, the following racy passage about Francis Xavier, the miracle worker. Before I do that, I have to read to you another quote of Lord Bertrand Russell, if you are not familiar with them. I have here a nice quote and I will read that to you immediately. That is from his work, The Impact of Science on Society, or as the author states it here, Science and Religion, you know, these kind of works. From the impact of science and society, Bertrand Russell, who lived between 1872 and 18, uh, 1970, wrote, quote, Gradually, by selective breeding, the, conge the congenital differences between rulers and the ruled will increase until they become almost different species. A revolt of the plebs would become as unthinkable as an organized insurrection of sheep against the practice of eating mutton." Unquote. And the second quote, Diet, injections and injunctions will combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable. And any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Unquote. This is Bertrand Russell. This Bertrand Russell, we read now from a quote here about Francis Xavier, the miracle worker. Quote, he and his companions wrote many long letters which were kept in them. They <coughs> were, which were kept in them. They gave accounts of, the la of their labors but none of those written in his lifetime made any mention of miraculous powers. Joseph Acosta, the Jesuit who was so much troubled by Pierrot's animals, expressly denied that these missionaries had been helped by miracles in their efforts to convert the pagans. But soon after Xavier's death, stories of miracles started to abound. It was said that he had the gift of tongues, 
even though his letters were full of allusions to the difficulties he had to master the Japanese language or find good interpreters. Stories were told of how, when his friends had felt thirsty at sea, he had changed salt water into fresh. When he dropped his crucifix into a sea, a crab brought it back to him. According to a later version, he had thrown the crucifix into a sea to still a tempest. When he was canonized in 1622, it was proved, to the satisfaction of the Vatican authorities, that he had accomplished miracles, as no one can become a saint without them. The Pope gave his official guarantee to the gift of tongues and was particularly impressed by the fact that Xavier had made the lamps burn with holy water instead of oil. This same Pope, Urban VIII, refused to believe Galileo's statements. The legend continued to improve. A biography by Father Bonor, published in 1682, tells us that the saint had resusc uh, resuscitated 14 persons during his lifetime. Quote, Catholic authors still attribute to him the gift of miracles. In a biography published in 1872, Father Coleridge of the Society of Jesus restated that he had the gift of tongues. Unquote. Judging by the exploits just mentioned, Saint Francis Xavier well deserved his, ha his halo. In China, the sons of Loyola had a long and favorable time with only a few expulsions in between. They obtained this on condition they would, uh, they would work there mainly as scientists and bow to the thousands of years old right of this ancient civilization. Quote, Meteorology was the main subject. Francis Xavier had already found out that the Japanese did not know the earth was round <laughs> and were very interested in what he taught them on that, uh, on that and other similar subjects. In China it became official and, as the Chinese were not fanatical, things developed peaceably. An Italian, Father Ricci, was the initiator of it. Having made his way to Peking, he played the part of an astronomer before the Chinese scientists. Astronomy and mathematics were an important part of Chinese institutions. And we all know what the Bible says about astronomy and astrology, right? These sciences enabled the sovereign to date their various seasonal religious and civil ceremonies. Ricci brought information which made him indispensable and he used this opportunity to speak about Christianity. He sent for two fathers who amended the traditional calendar, establishing the accord between the course of the stars and the earthly events. Ricci helped with lesser tasks as well. For instance, he drew a mural map of the empire, where he carefully put China at the center of the universe. This was the Jesuits' main work in that celestial empire. As for the religion's side of their missions, the interest in it was minute. It is rather amusing to think that in Peking the fathers were busy rectifying the astronomical mistakes of the Chinese, while in Rome the Holy See persistently condemned the Copernican system, and that until 1822. Yeah, let them condemn that, but they teach it now, and as always, everything that Rome teaches is 180 degrees opposite to what the Bible teaches. So when Rome teaches a solar system, we have a geocentric system. And I'm not going into flat earth and round earth, but you really have to think about that all the people, thousands of years long, adhering to the Bible, thinking that we were living on a flat earth. And today we are taught we are living on a round earth. I don't know. I don't go into that decision, but it's interesting that, of course, here the Holy See persistently condemned the Copernican system until 1822. And then, oh, 1822, then all of a sudden they accepted the Copernican system and 30 years later you had Darwin coming up with his evolution theory. 
And a hundred years later, you had Jesuit Lemaitre come out with the Big Bang Theory, and you have the Evolution Theory coming up. It's all about timing. It's all about timing before the world wasn't ready, and at that time the world was ready. And then all of a sudden, the Roman Catholic Church adopts the Copernican system in 1822. Yeah, because they now have another agenda, a more deceptive agenda. They have that still until today. In spite of the fact that the Chinese had very little inclination for mysticism, the first Catholic Church opened at Peking in 1599. When Ritchie died, he was, a re he was replaced by a German, Father Schell von Bell, an astronomer who also published some remarkable tracts in the Chinese language. In 1644, he was given the title of President of the Mathematical Tribunal, which created jealousy amongst the Mandarins. In the meantime, the Christian uh, Catholic communities organized themselves. In 1617, the emperor must have foreseen the dangers of this pacific penetration when he decreed the banishment of all foreigners. The good fathers were sent to the Portuguese at Macau in wooden cages. But soon after, they were called back. They were such good astronomers. In fact, they were just as good as missionaries with 41 residences in China, 159 churches and 257,000 baptized members. But a new reaction against them called for their banishment and Father Shell was condemned to death. No doubt he had not incurred this sentence merely for his work in mathematics. Huh? You are not being sentenced to death for mathematics. An earthquake and the burning of the imperial palace, cleverly presented as a sign of wrath from heaven, saved his life and he died peacefully two years later. But his companions had to leave China. In spite of all, the esteem for the Jesuits was so great that Emperor Kang He felt obliged to call them back in 1669 and ordered solemn funerals for the remains of Iam Yo Vam, means Jean Adam Shell. These unusual honors were only the start of exceptional favors. As we can read from the book from H. Burma. So being thrown out, being called back, being thrown out, being called back. And then even giving the opportunity to dig up the remains from Jean Adam Shell and giving him a so called fitting funeral, these unusual honors were only the start of exceptional favors. Yeah, I call that an exceptional favor. Now a Belgian father, Verbiest followed Shell at the head of the missions, and also the Imperial Mathematical Institute. He, this Belgium, was the one who gave to Peking's observatory those famous instruments whose mathematical precision is concealed by chimeras, dragons, etc. Kang He, the enlightened despot, was, who reigned for 61 years, appreciated the services of that scientist, who gave him wise advice, accompanied him to war and even managed a foundry for cannons. But his profane and warlike activity was directed ad majorem die gloriam, for the greater glory of God, as the good father reminded the emperor in a note he sent him before his death. Quote, Sir, I die happy as I used nearly every moment of my life to serve your majesty. But I pray him very humbly to remember after my death that my aim in all I did was to procure a protector for the most holy religion in this universe, and this protector was you, the greatest king in the East." Unquote. However, in China as in Malabar, this religion could not survive without some artifice. The Jesuits had to bring the Roman doctrine to the Chinese level, identify God with heaven, Tian, or the Chang Ti 
emperor from uh, from on high blend catholic rites with chinese rites accept confucian teachings the cult of the ancestors etc so what do we just hear it's about compromising but it is not about that the Roman Catholic Church is compromising to the Chinese rites, but that the Chinese rites have to compromise to everything the Roman Catholic Church brings into them. The Jesuits had to bring the Roman doctrine to the Chinese level. Identify God with heaven or the Changti, blend Catholic rites with Chinese rites, accept Confucian teachings, the cult of the ancestors, etc. That is not strange to Roman Catholicism people because Roman Catholicism has the same root as this Chinese religion, whatever you want to call it in that case, because they all come from Babylon. Pope Clement XI, who was told of it by rival orders, condemned this doctrinal laxism and, as a result, all the missionary work of the Jesuits in the Celestial Empire collapsed. So, Pope Clement XI thought there was really the Roman Catholic Church for once making advance, the Roman Catholic Church for once making any compromise. That was not possible. So, Pope Clement XI condemned this doctrinal laxism and as a result, all the missionary works of the Jesuits and the Celestial Empire collapsed. How did it go on? Well, the order also here in China had to secularize, as it did all over the world. And the successors of, Hang, of Kang He proscribed Christianity and the last fathers left in China died there and were never replaced. Yeah. They were never replaced by fathers, but they were replaced by, when they came back, disguised as secular jobs. You know, bankers, merchants, publishers, etc., etc., as we know from all over the world. And this finishes our introduction in section 3, chapter 1 on India, Japan and China. And I will continue next time with Chapter 2, The Americas, the Jesuit state of Paraguay, and we will read and learn about the Paraguayan reductions, the start of communism, how the Jesuits invented it, and how they took advantage of Paraguay and the Paraguayan people. But that is for another reading. Next time, Section, t uh, se section 3, Chapter 2, The Americas the Jesuit state of Paraguay. Up to here. I thank you for listening and watching the video, commenting. And until next time, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you. And signing off. Bye bye. A uh, special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day.
Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these uh, these dangerous goal of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From their own, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.